In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be Better it's one day in your cross than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Make me to know your ways, so Lord. Teach me your paths. Sanctify us in your truth. Your word is truth. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The Lord God is, is my, my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation. With joy will you draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Thanks to the Lord, call on His name, make known to His deeds among the peoples, proclaim that His name is exalted. The Lord God is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation. Sing praises to the Lord. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitants of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. The Lord God is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The Lord God is my strength and my soul. And he has become my salvation. The first reading for this evening is from 1 Samuel chapter 16, 1 to 13. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord, and invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for, for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peace, peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. 
consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen thee. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, there, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he said and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Psalm of the Days, the Psalm number 146. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man. In whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord. God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up the who, those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the soldiers. He upholds the window of the fatherless. But in the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever, your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. 
The second reading for this evening is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 to 13. If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I am a noisy gun or a twenty symbol. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but I have no love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have no love, I will gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not invite or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or reasonful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love fears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the prophecy comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. Uh, I talked like a child. I reasoned like a child, and I became a man, I gave up children's ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is one. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The reading from the Gospel for this evening is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, 31 to 43. And taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked, and shamefully treated, and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day he will rise. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what he said. As he drew near to Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing a crowd gathered by, he inquired what this meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Forever, Lord, your word is firm, firm is set in the heaven. I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I love the habitation of your house 
and the place where your glory dwells. You shall have no other gods. You shall not, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant, or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be to all of you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. That reading we just heard from 1 Corinthians will serve as the foundation for our sermon tonight. And I wonder how many of us have heard that same verse read at a wedding? Probably most of us. Megan and I certainly did. That part about love being kind, love is patient, love does not envy or boast. Those words seem so appropriate for a day centered around love, and so we hear it time and time again at weddings. Our sermon tonight is going to look at that 1 Corinthians text, and tonight we're going to speak about love, or more precisely, what it is love. And that may sound a little strange, because after all, we all know what love is, don't we? But how do you define it? What really is love? And that could be a hard question to answer because the word love has become so twisted and misused in our world. We have all these vague notions kind of floating around. And most of them are defined by joy or enjoyment of something. Which makes sense. If we really enjoy food, if we really enjoy a movie or a thing, at least in English, we often say we love it. So I, I tell lots of people that I'm in love, not only with my wife, but I'm in love with my wife's cooking. It's delicious. I love Star Trek and Star Wars. We say we love these things because we enjoy them. Taking that further, Another example, if we say we marry for love, that sounds good, but so often in this world, we're saying we're really marrying because we enjoy that person, right? Of all the people we found, we enjoy spending time with them. And that kind of usage, the word love, it's used to mean a, a warm, fuzzy feeling of excitement that you get when you enjoy something. That's 
probably the most common understanding of love in our many cultures. But is that the definition of love? So the world thinks it is. Something you simply enjoy. That doesn't sound quite right, does it? And yet it's the default position of a lot of people, even us sometimes. And so we love things that we enjoy, and on the other side of people, we love people who are good to us. We love those who love us and make us feel special, don't we? But if love is simply about our enjoyment, our pleasure, that means that love is defined by selfishness. All of a sudden, I love something because of what it gives and does for me. I love someone because of what they give and do to me. And in the world's definition of love, we sure see that a lot. After all, divorce is on the rise because once your spouse no longer provides adequate pleasure or enjoyment, we're told by the world that it's okay to leave them. After all, we're told you don't love them anymore. But if love is defined by our enjoyment, what we are really saying when we say we don't love our spouse anymore is that we don't enjoy their company or we'd enjoy the company of someone else. And then all of a sudden, love becomes not about the other person or two people. Love becomes solely about you as you reflect inward. What you feel, what you want, what gives you the most pleasure. And that's a bankrupt version of love. But that's the world's definition of love. A better question than what is love may be this. Who gets to define what love truly is? And then we have to ask ourselves, where does love come from? Who created it? The Lord God. God created love, so he is the one who gets to define what love is. And after all, who better, as we are even told in 1 John 4, 8, that God is love. You see, the character of God, who he is, because he is love, that is what truly defines the word love. And specifically in the person of Jesus Christ, we see this. In Colossians 1.15, we are told that Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God. He is the revelation of who God is. In the person of Jesus, God the Father is showing us his character. God defines love. God is love. And his revelation to us, the image he has given us to see his character is the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the definition of love God shows us in Jesus, which gets us to our first Corinthians reading, where God defines what love is, but if you read it apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, this reading is incomplete. Like all scripture, it points to the Lord. I'm sure we've heard verse 4 through 7 many, many times in our lives, but have you ever read it through Jesus? Jesus is the image of God. So he is the image of pure, true love. So first I'm going to read verse 4 through 7, but instead of love, I'm going to put in Jesus. This doesn't always apply to Scripture, but it works pretty well here. Let's read it. Jesus is patient and kind. Jesus does not envy or boast. He is not arrogant or rude. Jesus does not insist on his own way. Jesus is not irritable or resentful. Jesus does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. 
Jesus bears all things. Jesus believes all things. Jesus hopes all things. Jesus endures all things. So let's unpack that. Because when you do, not only does it show you what love truly is and what it looks like, but all of a sudden the world's definition of love is turned on its head. Jesus, that is love, is patient and kind. Think about that. Out of love for the world, Jesus waits. He is patient. The world hates and slanders the Lord Jesus. The world and its ruler, the devil, is the enemy of Jesus. And yet for those living in the world, he shows love and pity. Right now in Finland, a member of parliament and her Lutheran bishop are being prosecuted. Their crime? Simply believing God's word about homosexuality, apparently taking a picture of scripture, is now a crime in Finland. That's what that MP did, just posted it on Twitter. Every month, we hear of our dear brothers and sisters in Christ killed in church bombings and attacks in India and Africa and around the world simply for belonging to Jesus. Every year, millions of unborn children are murdered. The world is broken fundamentally. Evil is everywhere. The Lord Jesus Christ has every right to wipe humanity off the face of the earth, but he doesn't. He loves us instead. True love. Instead of wiping us off, instead of that, out of kindness, he patiently waits, hoping that more and more will turn to him Believe by his word and be saved before the end. Continuing, love does not envy or boast. Jesus does not envy or boast. He is not arrogant or rude. Jesus, even though he is God, he comes not as a grand lord in palaces, but he humbles himself and to be born of a peasant. He doesn't complain about it. Think of it, the king of the universe, the great I am, was born in a food trough for animals. He enters into the hovels of the poor and the diseased and the sinner. And what's more than that, the Lord Jesus willingly enters even filthier places than that. The Holy One of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, comes and lives in the hearts there's like you and I of sin think of that think of the defiling things that come from our hearts lust gossip slander hate and yet because of his great love for you and I and for our salvation Jesus Christ humbles himself and he dwells even in sinners like us. Do you see a pattern here? The world tells you that love is about what you want, about what you enjoy, but that's not what Jesus shows. Jesus shows us the true love is not about us at all, it's about the other person. In fact, true love isn't always enjoyed. Instead, it's often painful, it's often sacrificial for the one who is loved. Jesus is the image of God. He is the image of love. And what is the most common symbol associated with Jesus? It's the cross. It's the crucifix. This is what love looks like and it's terrifying 
and it's beautiful all at the same time. It's sacrificial for the other. Let's skip ahead to verse 7, because it's all about the cross. Jesus bears all things. It's interesting here, the word in the Bible, for the Greek word here for bearing all things or carrying all things, it means to bear or endure in silence. Here we're being shown the passion of our Lord where Jesus bears false trials, slanders, imprisonments, and tortures, all without speaking out. And why does he bear all things in silence? Out of love for you. And Jesus bore all of these things like a lamb led to slaughter to make an atoning sacrifice for you, his beloved. And then when he finally does make a noise, besides praying the Psalms, what does he use his words for? He uses them to actually pray for those who are doing this to him when he says, Lord, forgive them, they know not what they do. Because he loves even the Roman soldiers who nailed him to the cross and the Jewish leaders who betrayed and handed him over. Continuing in 1 Corinthians, Jesus believes all things. Jesus hopes all things. Now this one, admittedly, sounds kind of strange. But let's keep it in context of the scriptures and of Jesus. Now how can Jesus, if he's God, hope or believe? He's God, he should already know these things. Well, that's true, but Jesus is also fully man. And during his passion, he was afraid. We're told that on the night before his crucifixion, he sweats blood. So is so much anxiety does he have because he knows what is coming. He knows how he will be killed, how he will be tortured. But he faced those fears for you. And he faced those fears for a world and a people who don't believe who cannot believe on their own for a world and a people who have no hope. Jesus believed and Jesus held to the hope and promise that his father would raise him from the dead on the third day. And finally, Jesus endures all things. Jesus endured the cross for a world who hates him. He endured the cross for a people who don't deserve it. For people who still don't deserve it and who never will. And here at the cross, the Lord shows us that true love is not reserved for those who deserve it. Otherwise, he would never have endured this for you and I because we can't deserve it. No, instead of the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ shows us that true love is always a gift that is given. Love is not dependent on the capacity for the other person to earn it. Love is dependent on the capacity of someone to freely give it. And at the cross, it's forgiveness for all. Thanks be to God, even for the unforgivable like you and I, we are forgiven because of Christ Jesus. What a gift. What love is shown to us. The world's false definition of love is easy. You just enjoy what you enjoy. It asks nothing of you. And when you're done with it, throw it away. But that is not really love, it's selfishness. True love is hard. True love is work. What's more, true love is a gift given to those who don't always deserve it. After all, that is what we have received ourselves. 
So the next time you find it hard to love someone, reread 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. And remember how Christ has loved you. And how he has prepared you to love as he is loved by his Holy Spirit. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep and guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Have mercy. For the gift of divine peace and of pardon, with all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Have mercy. For the Holy Christian Church, and for the proclamation of the Gospel, and the calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Have mercy. For our nations, and for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Have mercy. For seasonal weather and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Have mercy. For those who labor, for those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. Have mercy. For all those in need, for the hungry and homeless, for the widow and orphan, and for all those in prison, let us pray to the Lord. Have mercy. For the sick and dying, and for all those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Especially for Ukraine and for the Ukrainian people, so that God may end their suffering and bring peace to them, let us pray to the Lord. Have mercy. Also for our brothers in faith in Ukraine, for Bishop Sergei Mashevsky, his family and his church, but also for Reverend Andy Hochau, his family and his church, for their safety and for their peace, let us pray to the Lord. Have mercy. We also pray for the leaders of the Russian Federation, especially for the President Vladimir Putin, to understand the misfortune they bring to this world and for God to make them to return from their plans to invade Ukraine, let us pray to the Lord. Have mercy. For Europe, for the United States of America, for NATO and for all its allies, for them to protect Europe against Russia's aggression, let us pray to the Lord. Have mercy. For our countries, especially for Romania, to be able to offer love, mercy and support for all immigrants who are coming for unite Ukraine to this country, or and for the confession of the church, to offer love and mercy to all Ukrainian immigrants arriving in Romania and the entire Europe, and to preach to them the good news of the gospel of Christ, let us pray to the Lord. Have mercy. Finally, for this and for all our needs of body and souls, 
Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. Blessed Lord, you have caused all the holy scriptures to be written for our learning. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and take them to heart, that by the patience and comfort of your holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. To Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you, for into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angels be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you will forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I command myself, my body, and soul, and all things. Let your holy hand be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Christ has been praised from the day. Hallelujah. Bless and preserve you all.